The greatest loss to a single family on board the Royal Mail ship Titanic when it sank after infamously hitting an iceberg on its maiden journey in April 1912 was that of the Goodwins of Melksham, Wiltshire in England. But it shouldn't have happened to them. Here we see how the fates conspired to put them on board that ship on that day. By 1912, the Goodwins had been living in Melksham for around seven years. They'd originally moved from London in order that Fred could provide a better life for his wife Augusta and their then five children than could be afforded through his job as a printing compositor for over a decade. For several years, Augusta had been in service for the Yockney family at Pockridge House in Corsham, Wiltshire, before they married in 1894, so the area would not have been unfamiliar to her, at least. The recently expanded Spencer & Company afforded that opportunity, and Frederick took up a job as a machine hand. Only recently they had been visited by Frederick's American family. Both his brother Thomas and sister Florence had already settled in Niagara. Thomas had moved there some time before the turn of the century and started a family. Florence had married Leopold Andreas Wilhelm Dietrich, or William Rutger, a postal clerk, in 1903 while still in London. And almost immediately they moved to America, where they had established a life with their three children. It's safe to assume that plans were either set in train or finalised for Frederick's emigration to the States and to join his brother and sister. So Florence loaned him $250, a situation at the Niagara power plant had been found, along with the house and furniture. His sister Lydia had also sent money to help. The first power plant was built in 1895, and an expansion of companies exploiting the natural resource of the falls in both Canada and America was taking place. So Fred was to give up his employment with Messrs Spencer & Co. Charles Edward had for some time been in the employ of Henry White's Limited in the town. He too was to leave his employment. Their eldest child Lillian was leaving her job as a nursemaid at Spy Park in nearby Chitto. And William was to leave his role that he'd only recently undertaken with Mr Woodward's, the librarian and printers, just yards from his home. As for Harold and Jesse, they were to leave their schooling at the local Lowbourne School. All the children, especially Jesse, were very bright and clever and it was chiefly to give them a good start in life that the family were emigrating. The Goodwins managed to get seven second-class tickets aboard the SS New York, but that meant that someone, probably Lillian, would have to stay behind and follow later. The first twist of fate occurred when Ernest Head, the butler at Spy Park, revealed to Lillian he had a ticket for the same ship and so offered his ticket in order they could all travel together. He would take a later ship. It was said at the time that father, mother and children were industrious, well-conducted people and were held in great respect by all who knew them. All the children attended Sunday school and the three elder boys were members of the parish church choir. The father-in-law of Fred's younger brother Frank, Abraham Lindholm, a ship's carpenter, carved six three-inch wooden cubes with tiny nested animals for each child to play with on the journey. They left no relatives in Melksham, but as the Wiltshire Times newspaper recalled, the family carried with them the best wishes of the townspeople, and amongst the parting gifts was a Bible presented to each of them by a friend and well-wisher. Their neighbour, Daniel Gale, wished them good luck and a safe voyage before passing on the address of his sister near Chicago. This pen belonged to Charles Edward and was given to Reg Bush, his school friend, just one week before they sailed and is now in the Melksham and District Historical Association's collection. With everything in place, they left Melksham on Tuesday the 9th of April. The second and final twist of fate was the national strike by coal miners that had finished on the 6th of April. Although finished, the disruption in supplies meant that many ships, the New York included, were unable to sail. White Star officials took advantage of the situation 
as their new ship, Titanic, was nowhere near full. So they would transfer the Goodwin family tickets from second class to third and refund the difference, immediately allowing for some of the family debt to be paid off and facilitating their journey without undue delay. On the morning of Wednesday the 10th of April, between 9.30 and 11.30, passengers were allowed to board. The Goodwins would have been given a health inspection to check for disease, lice and other infections, and so with a clean bill of health took their place on the ship. When Titanic left Southampton at noon, she had an estimated 2,240 people on board, about two-thirds of its capacity. One coincidence as the liner departed, the volume of water she displaced almost caused a collision with the SS New York, the Goodwin's original carrier, as it broke free from moorings and swung towards Titanic. A nearby tug pulled the New York clear and allowed Titanic to continue with only a small delay. The ticket was numbered 2144 and cost 46 pounds 18 shillings. It should be borne in mind that third class on Titanic was a better standard than second class on the New York and would have been better than anything the family had previously been accustomed to. To compete with rival shipping company Cunard, the White Star Line offered their steerage passengers modest luxuries in the hopes that emigrants would write to their relatives back home and encourage them to travel on the White Star Line ships. Rather than dormitory sleeping style areas, third class passengers had their own cabins. The single men and women were separated, women in the stern in two to six berth cabins, men in the bow up to ten berth cabins, often shared with strangers. Each stateroom was fitted with wooden panelling and beds with mattresses, blankets, pillows, electric lights, heat and a wash basin with running water, except for the bow cabins which did not have a private wash basin. Two public bathtubs were also provided, one for the men, the other for the women. After visiting Cherbourg, the ship called at Queenstown, now called Cove in Ireland, before departing at 1.30 in the afternoon on Thursday the 11th of April. Destination, New York. Third class passengers had their own dining facilities with chairs instead of benches and meals prepared by the third class kitchen staff. Passengers gathered in the third class common room where they could play with cards or chess or walk along the poop deck. The third class children played in the common room or explored the ship. For four days, it was probably the most exciting time of the Goodwins' lives. As we now know, the family and the ship itself never made it to New York because at 11.40 in the evening on the 14th of April, an iceberg was struck. And a little over two and a half hours later, 370 miles southeast of Newfoundland, the ship foundered. Immigration rules meant in common with all ships, the steerage area where the Goodwins were situated was fitted with grills to prevent the classes from mingling and the spread of disease. These gates were normally kept closed, although the stewards could open them in the event of an emergency. However, in the rush following the collision, the stewards, occupied with waking up sleeping passengers and leading groups of women and children to the boat deck, did not have time to open all the decks, leaving many of the confused third-class passengers stuck below decks, or at least having their evacuation delayed. Although many felt the ship would not sink, and that they would be safer staying put rather than be lowered in their lifeboats. Whether the Goodwins died of injury, drowning or hypothermia, we will never know. Arriving at 4.10am, RMS Carpathia rescued the 705 passengers and crew from Titanic's 20 lifeboats and carried them on to New York. By the evening of the 16th of April, the cable steamer Mackay Bennett was engaged to retrieve the dead floating on the surface in their life jackets. The following day at 12.35 in the afternoon, it cast off from Halifax, Nova Scotia on its grim mission, arriving at daybreak on Sunday the 21st. What met them was wreckage and many bodies, some mutilated and unidentifiable. As each corpse was brought aboard, it was assigned a number with any belongings put into a bag with the same number. The ship retrieved 306 bodies, 
116 were buried at sea, only 56 of those identifiable. Amongst the bodies recovered, body number four was that of a boy about two years old dressed in a grey coat with a fur collar and cuffs, brown serge coat, brown petticoat, flannel garment, pink woolen singlet, brown shoes and stockings. The medical opinion was that death had been instantaneous in all cases owing to the pressure when the bodies were drawn down into the vortex. Body number four drifted to the recovery cutter, face up, without a scratch or a bruise. He had been floating without a life jacket for almost a week. Engineer Clifford Creese lifted the small boy from the icy water and he and his fellow crew vowed to give him a proper funeral if he remained unclaimed. They nicknamed him Our Babe. The Mackay Bennett, now dubbed the Death Ship, returned to Halifax Harbour with its 190 bodies. Our babe was one of only two third-class passengers to be placed in a coffin. The rest were sewn into shrouds. Except for a privileged few whose remains were taken to specific funeral homes, the bodies were taken to the Mayflower Curling Rink, which had been set up as a makeshift morgue. Here began the task of identifying the bodies. Of those identified, most were first or second class. It is worth noting, however, that during this process, Frederick Goodwin was obviously misidentified as he was originally marked in official records as saved. The bodies were reclothed by local clothiers with wet clothing removed and burnt, except for the leather shoes of our babe. Earl Northover, the night duty officer, could not bear to destroy them and so placed them in a box and removed them to his office at the police station. Once all bodies were in place, only then could they be publicly viewed. Body number four, a small casket, was smothered with red roses. No third-class families were contacted to come to Halifax to see if their relatives' bodies had been retrieved from the ocean. Impoverished families waited weeks for official information from the White Star Line and simply had to assume their loved ones had drained. The unknown child inevitably remained unclaimed. And so Captain Larnder, pictured here with a moustache seated in the centre, along with his crew of the Mackay Bennett, were allowed to adopt him. These sailors provided the distinctive headstone that separated the boy from those placed merely below a numbered headstone. For a while, reports spread around Melksham that Mr William Locke, formerly of Stratton Sons and Meads, was also on the Titanic. But on the Wednesday following the disaster, one of his friends received a postcard from Southampton stating that he would probably sail to America on the SS St. Louis. In America, Thomas Goodwin and his sister Florence Rutger, pictured here, were left waiting for news of their brother and the family after their names did not appear on the published passenger list of those saved and so were aware of their potential fate. However, for the following week, Augusta's sister, Clara Berry of Brook Green Hammersmith in England, was in complete ignorance of the fate which had overtaken the family. She was unaware that they were in any danger as she thought they were on the line in New York. Her brother-in-law's mother, and as Frederick and Augusta were cousins, Frederick's mother, a lady of 70, brought the dreadful news. Another coincidence was that Clara was going to the evening memorial service for the Titanic victims at St Barnabas Church in Kensington at the time. The fact Frederick's mother was out at all caused some surprise. As she said, I've come to tell you about Gussie, Augusta's family name. She then handed Clara a cablegram from the relatives at Niagara Falls. All gone was the message. Nothing more than that. Word had already reached Melksham, whether by official sources or not, and the memorial service of the same day was dedicated to the town's former residents. The order of service was printed by Charles Woodward, young William's employer. At 11am on Saturday the 4th of May 1912, 75 sailors assembled at the curling club to escort the six pallbearers from the crew, including Cliff Crease. The small white coffin was carried to a horse-drawn hearse where its journey was lined with quiet mourners. As it entered St George's Round Church, 
chosen as most of the sailors attended there, they were surprised to see so many people standing outside. After the service, the coffin was taken to Fairview Lawn Cemetery. The numerous floral tributes had to be brought by a separate cab. All this was for our babe, body number four. Augusta's will of the 19th of September 1912 left 26 pounds 11 shillings to her sister Carla and husband Ernest. Following investigations, the family's property was recorded by the American Red Cross at $250, of which the Red Cross awarded $150 to Florence and her husband to cover the money loaned to them. Frederick's mother, Mary, was granted a pension of five shillings per week by the English Titanic Fund. The family have subsequently been remembered at the local parish church in Melksham. The story, however, was not finished. In 1991, the Titanic International Society was formed. It inscribed names on six previously unidentified victims buried at Fairview Lawn Cemetery in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The society also contributed to the DNA project that resulted in the final identification of the unknown child. In 1998, a Titanic Paleo DNA project was formed. On Friday, May the 18th, our babe was exhumed. Part of the owner, three teeth and a funeral ribbon that read, God bless our son were recovered. With no actual evidence, the assumption since 1912 was that the child was Gustav Paulsen, a Swedish toddler. DNA tests with relations ruled this theory out. By 2004, there were only two candidates remaining with many similarities which show that they were very distantly related. Another coincidence. And in a rush to meet a TV deadline, 13-month-old Aino Panula from Finland was announced as the name of the unknown child. In 2005, following the passing of Officer Northover, his family donated the shoes he had retained back in 1912 to the Maritime Museum. Immediately, people questioned the size of shoes and pressure mounted to re-examine the DNA tests. Originally, only the bone had been used, almost exhausting the source DNA. This time, the teeth were examined and here, a crucial difference emerged between the two sources, proving beyond doubt that the body recovered in April 1912, body number four, our babe, was indeed Sidney Leslie Goodwin the only body of Melksham's Goodwin family to be recovered and identified.